Uh -huh. Okay, guys, we will uh, begin the last session of the day shortly, and it will be about demography and climate change, and we will begin with Nacho Juarez Martinez about demography and phenology in response of climate change. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, to the dismay of at least one person in the audience, I'm going to talk about penguins. Um, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the support. Uh, but um, and I know it's the is the last session of the day, and I know we're tired despite caffeinated. So I promise uh, my talk would not be very heavy because I'm going to try to weave a story with you about what's happening to uh, penguins in Antarctica. And I promise it will only have four plots and at least as many uh, nice penguin pictures, okay? So, let's go. So, uh, it won't surprise to anybody in this audience to know that what is happening in Antarctica is a massive warming, especially in the area that we study, that is the Antarctic Peninsula, in both maps on the top, left-hand side, there is massive warming and there is massive ice melt, which uh, to, again, every member in this audience possibly uh, triggers the question, uh, so, okay, so what's happening to the animals living there, especially to the seabirds, uh, animals that we know that they are uh, sentinels for their environment, okay? So that is going to be uh, the question that I'm going to try to answer today. Um, so, to answer this question, I am going to be talking to you to these three little beauties. The three species are the gentus, the adelis, and the chinstraps. The three are in the same genus, in the same genus Pygocelids, and uh, the three of them are uh, breeding um, more or less sympatrically. To, uh, to study these penguins, what we're going to use is the Penguin Watch uh, network of cameras throughout uh, the Antarctic Peninsula and um, many of the islands uh, located around the Scotia Sea. Uh, just to locate you on the map, the, the peninsula on the top uh, left-hand side is Patagonia, so the southern bit of uh, South America, and Antarctica is just opposite. Um, to uh, the, the things that we're going to study, to, um, or the parameters that we're going to study um, to see how climate change is affecting these species is phenology. We have 10 years of data uh, for all of these colonies. Um, uh, well, not all colonies have 10 years of data, but we do have uh, at most 10 years of data for all of the colonies here. We have around 9 million images and we have temperature readings associated to those images because what we use are camera traps. So we're going to make use, we're going to be making use of all of that to understand their change. Um, so let's have a brief introduction to these three species because uh, I know that you're not, uh, you, uh, you, most of you work on, even on the other hemisphere. So let's start with the dailies. Uh, and chin straps. They are both creo specialists and as you can see in the map, they breed a bit, uh, mo mostly in the, in the Antarctic Peninsula, especially the Adelis, who are one of the two true Antarctic species together with the emperor. So, except for like a tiny uh, colony, they all live in Antarctica. Uh, and they love sea ice. Uh, chin straps, uh, as you can see, they breed uh, the, their main colonies in the South Sandwich Islands, so uh, kind of right of the map and they do have abundant colonies on the, on the Antarctic Peninsula. And then we have the third cousin, the gentus, who are possibly the one that is the most different. So gentus is the biggest one of the three species. They do, um, we actually, all of these colonies that I'm showing on the map, we don't even know if they are even the same species. There's big discussion about it. Uh, but they breed uh, a lot on the subantarctic islands, and now they breed on the, on the Antarctic Peninsula. Okay, so what is happening to the phenology of these three species? What is happening, I'm going to be showing to you in plots like this. So uh, in these plots, you will see that on the y-axis, you have the date for the settlement at the colony. I know that for, uh, normally for phenological studies, most of you will have seen or used first arrival, uh, but first arrival was really, really difficult uh, as a di very difficult measure 
uh, to extract from cameras, especially for gentoos, because they are not always migratory and they are there for the whole winter. So I defined, or we defined, settlement at the colony as the first day uh, after winter that the presence of uh, the species is continuous and we don't see any gaps that are not due to mist or whatever in the colony. So that's settlement at the colony. And I'm going to plot a lot of uh, linear models, uh, straight lines going up and down, uh, in response to uh, a variable in this time year. And these colonies, these lines are going to be colored by the colors that you see on the right-hand side. These colors are the, the co one color for each colony, and they're organized from darker, so more polar, to brighter, more temperate colonies. Okay? So let's go with the first one and see how has their phenology evolved with the years. And what we see is that their phenology has uh, basically... Um, advanced. For all three species, the phenology is mostly advancing. If you look at chin straps, except for one colony, they are all advancing and they're all advancing more or less at the same rate. For Adelis, we see that m the majority of them are advancing their phenology. And if you realize, although this is more, uh, uh, more I think, of n noticing, more nuanced, uh, they are kind of, they more or less have the same slope depending on the region. So, for example, the purple colonies, uh, the yellow colonies are in different broad regions and they behave differently for each region. And gentoos are a mess, but in general and in the models, we see that they are advancing and they are doing so significantly. Okay, so now we're going to have a look and make use of all of that temperature data that we have from these cameras. Because we know the temperature is warming and you know, first hypothesis is, well, it is warming, that is what's advancing their phenology. And what we see is that uh, for Adelis, and, uh, that this is true, uh, but it's only significant for Adelis and chin straps. Uh, for Gentoos, despite you can clearly see, and actually the, the model tells you that, yes, they are advancing, for Gentoos is not significant. We are going to, we're going to see, um, we're going to discuss what this possibly means later, because despite, you see, warming is advancing the phenology. Easy, no? Good. The problem is that we also looked, uh, uh, we also looked, at, we looked at two variables to see, you know, to see which one was driving the, um, the, the advance, the phenological advance. But actually, when we got this other, this other variable that is also related to warming, so the further to the right that you go on the x-axis, the more warming there is, the fewer, uh, the, the more days above zero degrees of temperature that there are, the later a daily and chinstras breed, but the earlier that gentoos breed. So, and it, that one is significant. Okay, it's a lot of plots. We're going to recap in a second. I'm just going to show you the fourth and last plot, as I promised, and uh, this is just more of a curiosity. That is uh, something that we would expect and something that we have seen. Uh, in other species, especially in the northern hemisphere, but I don't think it had been previously shown at this scale with one method, uh, with one metric, and uh, throughout such a longitudinal area that is, uh, sorry, latitudinal gradient, that is uh, the, um, how uh, colonies are breeding later, the more polar there are. And how Adelis are the first one to breed, then it's chin straps, uh, oh, no, to settle, uh, first is Adelis, then is Chinstraps, and finally there is Gentus. Okay, let's make sense of all of the info that I've provided you with, you with, provided you with today, and let's see if we can together piece up a story. Okay, so we have Adelis, Chinstraps, and Gentus, specialist, specialist, generalist. All of them are advancing their phenology uh, as response to warming. All of them, although for Gentus is not significant, are being driven, the, the, the race in air temperature is drawing their, this, uh, their, their phenological advance, they're advancing to earlier days. And, you know, we can think like, you know, like, you know, ice is melting, the uh, colony is becoming free of ice uh, earlier, so that is, that is what we think. The problem comes when another uh, metric related to warming, postpones the breeding. And what we think here, and this is a hypothesis, and uh, this is why I need you to help us 
piece the story together, is how could the same warming be postponing, um, postponing breathing? And what we think is because if there is less ice, there is less algae that grow on the ice. And if there is less algae that grows on the ice, there is less krill that can feed on that algae. And if there is that krill, the two krill specialists will take longer to gain the body mass necessary to, gain the, um, uh, to, to, to start the breeding. And uh, we know that there are many studies linking the presence of ice with uh, krill, and that's why we think that is what is happening. And that kind of fits with their actual population trends, because the current population trends of these species, and especially at the colonies that we, that we are looking at, is that the, both the adelis and the chin straps are declining rapidly, and the gentoos are establishing more and more uh, colonies uh, throughout the peninsula, and their numbers are increasing in these colonies. So I think we are in a situation where we can speak that in the Antarctic Peninsula there is a situation where there are winners and losers of climate change, with adelis and chinstras declining and uh, being outcompeted by the more generalist gentoo. We do need to investigate whether this relationship with krill is true, and we also need to uh, investigate how much is uh, this affecting their breathing, um, their breathing success, that that is going to be the next chapter in my thesis. So uh, finally, just uh, thanks to all of our collaborators and all of the organizations and all of the lovely people in each of these organizations that have mm, you know, done a lot to more than their fair share to help us gather this amount of data. Thank you very much. Anyone have a question? Hi, uh, excellent talk. I was just wondering, um, in your analysis, did you try to separate the effect of within colony changes from between colony changes, or was it all? Y yes, yes, mixed it is up? separated. It's a, so it is a mixed model with colony as a, a random effect to and separate. random slope as well. And uh, random slope, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, great talk, thank you. Um, just apologies if you've mentioned this already, but uh, are you planning to look at um, uh, actual measures of ice coverage uh, historically from satellite data? That would be great, but I don't know if I will have time in my PhD. But yes, I would. If, if I had time, sure. <laughs> like, like, the thing is, like, I, COVID has been a mess, and uh, I'm catching up, so I'm prioritizing. But yes, uh, that would be lovely. Okay, good luck. Good. Thanks again, and good luck with the PhD. <laughs>
And some of those uh, threats include changes in environmental conditions and food availability. In, uh, in particular, southern pelagic uh, species show strong population declines. And to understand the effects of ongoing global change um, on these population uh, dynamics, long-term monitoring studies are vital um, but rare. So for our project, um, we focused on Wilson storm petrels. And storm petrels are the world's smallest seabird. And the Wilson storm petrels are the smallest um, endotherms breeding on Antarctica. Sorry. They're also considered one of the most numerous seabird species. And combined with their highly migratory um, behavior, that makes them a very uh, unique link in these marine habitats or in these marine um, food webs. So we collected um, breeding data from two colonies on King George Island. Um, okay. Yeah. The colony around the Polish base where I went myself. I'm from, around, I'm from the colony around the, Antarctic, the uh, Argentinian base, which is about 14 kilometers to the southwest. Oh, I guess it caught up with me. Um, we, okay, sorry, it's, yeah, I'm not sure what it's doing. Yeah, okay, we collected data um, from 1979 until 2020, um, but there are considerable gaps. And in total, we have data from about 27 years. Um, one of the things that is interesting for this uh, particular area is that King George Island does not have a standing stock of krill. Instead, it is transported by the currents and westerly winds from the um, wintering area in the Bellingshausen Sea, which, well, the aerial should have shown up by now, but it was a bit quick. Um, which means that storm petrels are affected by changes in the environment and the environmental conditions that might affect food availability. But as you can see here, it can also affect nest um, accessibility and microclimate. So the aims of this project were to summarize all of the available data and to study the links or the relationships be between environmental conditions and, pop and breeding population dynamics. Based on previously published uh, research on Antarctic seabirds, we, uh, we expected to find evidence for population declines, reduced breeding output, and their breeding phenology to have shifted to later in the year. And we expected these changes to be related to changes in food availability and adverse weather conditions at the breeding sites. Wilson storm petrels are an elusive species. They breed in hard to reach places, in cracks and crevices, and the adults are mostly active at night. That means that it can be quite difficult to collect um, direct measurements of population size. Additionally, since the data we've used here comes from different studies um, with different, um, Sorry, with the, and with, yeah, from different studies collected by different teams and for different research purposes, um, the measurements may have differed between years. So to still be able to describe the population dynamics, we just looked at all of the available breeding data, including laying success, which we calculated by dividing the number of eggs by the maximum number of nests found in previous years, hatching success, which we collect. Uh, calculated by dividing the number of chicks by the same uh, maximum number of nests. And both of these, therefore, represent a population-wide um, productive, productivity measurement. We also looked at hatching dates, um, the number of adults caught in mist nets at the Argentinian station, um, food web coloration, so the ratio of birds with black spots in the food webs, because that is a proxy for age, and older birds have more black spots um, in their food webs. We looked at chick growth parameters, chick provisioning, and fledgling success. And fledgling success we, collect, um, we calculated by dividing the number of chicks, uh, or the number of fledglings by the number of chicks in the same year, and that was done, therefore, a measurement of um, chick survival. 
And then we looked at various um, environmental conditions on various scales um, that we thought might affect these breeding parameters. These included sea ice cover in the Bellingshausen Sea, wind conditions at the breeding uh, grounds, precipitation, and both air and sea surface temperatures. And then we used pairwise bootstrapped linear models to see um, what the relationships between these environmental conditions and the breeding um, data were. And we used the, co the bootstrapped coefficients to see if these effects were positive or negative. And we, we said that um, a, a result or one of these um, correlations was significant if zero lay outside of the 95% confidence interval. And here that's um, shown for the correlation between laying success and year. So now I will show you some of the selected results um, on the temporal changes in the breeding data. Um, because of time constraints, I cannot actually describe all of the different um, effects of the environmental conditions on these um, breeding data, um, but I will share the, the conclusions later in the presentation. So at the Argentinian station, um, adults were caught in a mist net at the same place and with the same net size through all of the study years. However, the timing and duration of each field season differed, and therefore we had to correct for that um, by calculating the number of adults caught per hour during peak hours in relation to the sunset. And the results are shown here. Um, with the mean number of adults caught per year on the y-axis and then year on the, on the x-axis. As you can see, there have been substantial declines. If you compare the average, um, yeah, up to a 90% decrease in adults caught at Carlini or at the Argentinian station, if you compare the means of the first three years with the means of the later years. Now, misnet captures often include non-breeding birds. So these numbers might not directly reflect population size changes. However, this 90% decrease corresponded to a 90% decrease in active nests found around the Polish station in 1979 compared to those found in 2017 and 2018. At the same time, we found no change in age structure. So no change in the number of, um, the ratio of birds with food spots compared to those without food spots. The substantial declines in population sizes was, um, uh, were accompanied by substantial declines or significant declines in laying success and hatching success. But um, fledgling success actually increased over time. And we found slight but significant changes in growth rate. However, they went in opposite directions. Chick tarsus growth rate increased over time while well, both wing and body mass um, growth rate significantly decreased over time. At the same time, we found no significant change um, in hatching dates. However, in the more recent years, um, snowstorm um, events prevented egg adults from entering the nest at, at some, uh, in some years and caused uh, total failure at the egg stage in other years because the adults just could not enter the nest. <laughs> So to summarize, we found substantial declines in population sizes, but a continued recruitment rate. So we think that the reduced breeding output might be caused by the smaller population size rather than just lower parental quality or bad weather at the breeding sites. With the current project or in the current manuscript, we could not explain why the growth, chick growth rates went in opposite directions but we suggest that the, tarsus growth, the increase in tarsus growth rate might reflect a drive for shorter nestling periods, while well, especially the, the reduction in um, chick body mass growth might be in response to lower food availability or lower food quality. While hatching dates did not significantly advance, so the nestling uh, period or the breeding period did not necessarily um, get shorter, the, increased unpredictability of weather conditions around the Ar uh, Antarctic Peninsula might still um, 
favor shorter nestling periods. We found that all of the population, or most of the population changes, could be linked to changes in um, environmental conditions affecting either food availability or weather condition, and in particular, snowstorm prevalence. And with the increased, uh, or with the ongoing and predicted increase in temperatures, um, it's likely that food availability will um, decline, while precipitation, and in particular snowstorms, are, um, are, will continue to increase. And that might cause further population declines, or at the very least, might prevent the population from recovering. However, we could not include um, environmental conditions at the non-breeding period. And whales and storm pretzels are highly migratory. They are seen all the way up to in the North Atlantic, and they might therefore be vulnerable to changes throughout um, the Atlantic and in the non-breeding areas. And we actually also found that food availability during the fledgling period might affect recruitment rates um, years later. So for future studies, um, it would be very interesting to um, be able to track these birds because at the moment we only know roughly where the important non-breeding areas are based on stable isotope analysis. And of course, continued monitoring of the, um, of the population is important to understand the effects of environmental conditions on population uh, dynamics. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any question? Thanks for that. It was a great talk and gorgeous pictures, of course. Um, just wondering, with the colonies being located on King George Island, are you getting any signal to, from population change to reacting to Deception Island volcanism? Mm. Like you'd expect with the pygoskelets um, on King George? Uh, not that I, I mean, that's not something we've considered. Um, so I don't know. Just maybe with ash plumes or anything similar? Well, there's no active volcano or anything, so... I wouldn't expect that. Thank you. No. Thanks again. All right. So now it's Morten that will speak about European seabirds uh, breeding productivity. Yes, uh, I'm really going to try to bore you here because uh, this is a desk study. So there will be no nice pictures from field sites or cuddly birds or anything. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so this is a. Uh, Obviously, like most other work, it's a collaboration with a lot of people that uh, I would like to acknowledge up front. So, the starting point of this work is that the EU has brought in some years ago what's called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, uh, which aims to protect and manage European seas. Big words, but uh, one of the things in there is that there's a requirement for the member states to make regular assessments of good environmental status. Uh, every six years and the EU has decided on a set of so-called descriptors which uh, the countries must report on and one of them is called D1C3 beautiful and it's actually demographical state uh, so this is used for biodiversity and among that for seabirds and these uh, how to specifically do this is something that's developed and maintained by the regional seas conventions OSPAR in this part of the world, HELCOM in the Baltic, and the Barcelona Convention in the Mediterranean. Uh, this is mainly uh, concerned with OSPAR, who are next year developing their major quality status report, uh, where they will report on their indicators, and that will then be used for the MSFD by the countries. So why would you want an indicator for breeding productivity? So uh, basically, we 
we're really just interested in the state should be how many birds are there. Well, no, it's not all. Because abundance uh, reacts, as we know, in species like seabirds that are long-lived, it reacts very slowly to environmental change. So, and another thing is that most uh, counts of seabirds concern only the breeding segments. So any changes that happen in the pre-breeding life will not be picked up. Breeding productivity is, uh, is much more responsive and is expected to have some sort of link to lower trophic links as well. So we could use seabirds as a general indicator of ecosystem state. And of course, we also see that uh, breeding success could have implications for future population growth so that we could have a sort of early warning indicator. And another reason is that at least in some countries we have some data that already exists. So let's try and use them and see if um, they make sense. So this was actually in attempted already in the last round of OSPAS uh, assessments where an indicator was produced that was based on breeding success failure. So if uh, it measured the proportion of colonies where breeding productivity was below some sort of threshold, um, there were some issues with that. The threshold was sort of arbitrary, and you could say even if the breeding productivity was above the threshold, it could still affect uh, future population growth. And also that the impact of breeding failure would depend on the li rest of the life history of the species. So could we do better? This is something that's been discussed for years in uh, what's called the Joint Working Group on Marine Birds uh, among Ospar, Isis, and Helcom. And uh, now we have actually come up with a new approach that will be implemented in the new uh, Ospar Quality Status Report. So the logic of this is, as we said, breeding productivity does affect future population growth, but how strongly? We don't really know unless we consider the rest of the life history of the species. And that requires a population model. So basically this is all about population modeling. We use matrix population models that uh, predict population growth as a function of survival, breeding productivity, and recruitment. And the metric we use in this indicator is the expected population growth rate. So given the observed breeding productivity, what population growth rate would we expect? So how do you set a threshold for that? When is a growth rate good enough? Well, we thought of it, and then we came up with the solution of referring to the IUCN's red list criteria. This is something that's well known and accepted. And we are particularly using the threshold for red listing as vulnerable, which is 30% decline over three generations. You can easily convert that to a per generation growth rate threshold, but the conversion to an annual growth rate that will then be species specific and will depend on the generation time of the species. Again, we need a population model to, do, to get to that point. So in practice, what do we do? Well, we start with what we have. We have uh, an excellent review of demography of European seabirds by Horsewell and Robinson a few years ago. And then we have some uh, observed uh, values of breeding productivity, so that's the monitoring data. We have an abundance indicator. I'm not going to get into where that comes from. So we start by produ uh, producing a base population model based on the literature then we tune that so that it can reproduce the observed abundance trend using the observed breeding productivity. That means we adjust the survival values until everything fits. This model can then give us a generation time. From the generation time, we get the threshold. So what growth rate is good enough, we get here. We can again combine it with the observed breeding productivity to get the expected population growth under current uh, circumstances. And then by comparing those two, we have an assessment. This tells us is expected growth rate below or above the threshold. So we do this for each species and each of the regions within the OSPA area. So this is about 50 models approximately. So let's take the black lead kittiwake as an example, just a random one. Um, which, of course, we all know is widely monitored, which is a great uh, 
advantage in this case. It's also shown a large population decline, and it's regarded as very sensitive. So we're looking at it in what's called the Greater North Sea in the OSPA language, and that's the sort of olive green area here. And uh, if we look at that, we get, this is the, uh, the observed values of breeding productivity. The red line is the annual um, values, and the numbers are just the number of monitoring plots contributing to that. So it's widely monitored. The black line is a six-year retrospective running mean, which we are using to get rid of the sort of most extreme year-to-year -year fluctuations. We are in, interested in long-term trends here. So through our models, we can then get a generation time. And with the generation time, we get the expected growth rate and we get the thresholds. So here, the colors in this plot refer to the different threat categories under IHN. So yellow is vulnerable, orange endangered, red critically endangered. So that's what, the, um, what you would red list the species as if you only used this breeding productivity indicator. So basically, uh, the, ex the current level of breeding success would lead to an expected population decline of about 4% per year, which is not good. Um, the next slide, I, I probably should ask you not to tweet this one because uh, this is the overall results, and it's not really official yet. It will be relatively soon, so please don't. So here is... Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through the species, but this is all the species we looked at in the different regions. What I do want you to pick up here is that there's a lot of red here. So red here means that the species fails the indicator of breeding productivity in that region. Green, it passes. And in the red, you can even see that uh, we've, EN means that it also fails uh, um, a threshold for endangered, and CR, it fails the threshold for critically endangered. So things are looking pretty bad, particularly in the North Sea. Uh, we also then have a way of integrating this across species. We split them into three functional groups, wading feeders, surface feeders, and water column feeders. And then the threshold at this level is that 75% of the species should pass the, the species-specific thresholds. So again, it doesn't look very good. Most of the colors are red, and for all the three regions where we have considerable amounts of data, the Arctic waters, Greater North Sea, and the Celtic Seas, the overall assessment is failed. So breeding success is not good enough to maintain seabird populations for uh, the coming years. And we probably shouldn't place too much emphasis on the Bay of Biscay and Iberian coast passing here because it's based on data from just two species, so it's not really very representative. So um, this, besides this, which is the important thing, we also get some byproducts from the approach uh, by constructing all these population models. So again, looking at the North Sea kittiwakes, we get inferred values for age-specific survival that are required to, uh, to get everything to add up. So these tuned values, so we're here in this case, first and second year survival. <laughs> Uh, we get the generation time, I already showed that, and we also get the productivity that would be required under current conditions to stabilize the population. So it, if we should save the kitty wake just by increasing breeding productivity, it should be up to 1.13 chicks per pair. And we intend to publish these values as well across all the species, and uh, this would really allow for some very interesting cross-cutting analysis and could be used for population models in all sorts of contexts. Next steps, extend this to other areas. We are already doing that. But probably more important is to really move into an integrated population model context, because that's what you should do here. We could use all the data then, including published estimates of survival or the raw data. We could have proper error propagation. We could include density dependence. We would predict where the population is expected to go. But this is quite a large thing, and data access may be a bit more, diffi may be a bit more difficult, so we're not there yet. 
So that's it. I just want to thank everybody who contributed, including some groups of people who don't get acknowledged so often, the people who actually keep track of all these databases so that after 40 years or 50 years of, of data collection, we can start doing this sort of thing. And of course, the funders and uh, you for your attention. Thanks, Martin. Great talk, even if kind of really depressing. Uh, we have time for one short question. Thanks, Martin. That was a really great talk. I was wondering whether there are any particular species or um, regions and species that you were data deficient in that you would want to prioritize for finding more information on in the sorry, future. Sorry, can were you... Were there any, any species that were particularly data deficient that you that would need more information on to, to do this analysis in the future? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I didn't go through the species. There are some species we, that we couldn't include because data are not there. There are some, uh, I could mention the IDAR actually as a strange example that's difficult to include because some areas people uh, count the number of hatching chicks and others, they count the number of fledglings, and uh, we, can't, we couldn't really get those to add up and go into the same model. So <laughs> that's also some standardization uh, would help as well. But there are definitely species where more, more data are needed. I think someone else having one question. Good morning. So who decides where the pass-fail threshold is, and has that just become a political game in the end? You had it for 75% need to pass, but could I just make it 30% and then it all looks a lot better? So you mean the, the, for the cross-cutting, uh, uh, the 75%, that is a suggestion made by this uh, joint working group on marine birds, and no one has complained about that, so that's what we're using. <laughs> Thanks again, Martin. <laughs> now, it's Hannah, which will talk about declines in the breeding success of two sibling species of storm petrels. Uh, hi, and uh, thank you to the organizing committee for putting this conference together. It's so great to see people in person again. Um, so my name's Hannah Harrowood, I'm delighted to uh, I recently passed my Viva, and so this is my first um, conference uh, after <laughs> passing my Viva. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so <laughs> today uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, one, of, one of my PhD chapters and uh, looking at the uh, breeding success changes over the last 20 years of two species of storm petrel that breed on the same islet but at different times of year. So we've got the Montero storm petrel, which is endemic to the Azores and breeds in the summer, April through September. And the Bandrumt, uh, which is more widespread uh, across the oceans, but in the Azores breeds in the winter, September through March. Before I begin, a huge thank you to these many different people, funders and uh, organizations for making my PhD possible, especially those that are in the audience uh, today. So, as we've had a little bit already this afternoon, long-term monitoring is really uh, important and useful. Um, and some of the variables that, that uh, are really important for that um, aid in identifying changes in breeding, breeding productivity and population dynamics. And, and when um, these changes have been identified, it's then possible to start looking at the potential causes of these changes. And then the results from that then potentially lead to guiding conservation action. So uh, the delights of this, this study is that uh, one of my, uh, uh, two, two of my supervisors uh, deployed artificial nest boxes on, um, on the islet that I worked on uh, in 2000. So uh, the top picture on, on the left-hand side is, is Renata, and she's deploying nest boxes, and then myself in the bottom picture 20 years later. So as I said, I've worked on an islet, and uh, myself and co-authors have researched these two storm petrels on Iliad de Praia, and Ilya, uh, Ilya de Praia sits uh, in the central group of the Azores archipelago, and the Azores is found on the mid-Atlantic ridge of Portugal. 
There were various different methods uh, that I'll, I'll briefly touch on now, and they'll hopefully become more apparent as I go through the results. Um, but there were two different um, intense periods of study, uh, 2000 to 2001 and 2018 to 2020. And these were intense periods of study where uh, the nests were checked almost daily. Uh, and during that time, the nest histories were identified, um, potential causes of egg and chick loss, and also once the, um, the chick had hatched, weighing the chick daily um, until it fledged or didn't survive. Um, and then during the inter intervening years, the nests were checked once or twice a season to estimate their breeding success rate. I'll also talk about, a bit about weather and the weather uh, uh, I extracted from the R package global surface summary of the day and extracted the uh, uh, various different weather variables uh, into the months during the breeding season. So there's breeding season um, months for each species and that's um, averaged across, across the months per year. Yeah, so... Uh, the first question was, what has changed? Uh, has the breeding success changed over the last 20 years? And so this graph shows along the x-axis the uh, years, and on the y-axis is the proportion of eggs that resulted in fledged chicks. And there's two different colors on the graph. We've got the uh, Montero storm petrel, which is in red, uh, and the Van Rempt, which is in blue. And kind of the key point from this graph is that uh, both lines are declining, and the Monteros is declining more substantially um, over, over the last 20 years. So in my PhD, I go into a lot more detail and a lot more variables, which I, I sadly don't have time to bore you with today. Um, but I will uh, briefly mention three different variables that, uh, that I, I suggest uh, to at least two of them contribute to this breeding success decline. So the first uh, is uh, the chick growth, which can be used as, as a proxy for um, chick provisioning rates from the, from the parent adults. And there's, again, there's these two graphs on, on the slide. So we've got chick age in days along the x-axis, uh, where day one is the emergence of the uh, chick from the egg, and chick mass along the y-axis. And the Monteros uh, have four colored lines. Uh, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, they're, they're the four different uh, intense periods of steady years uh, from the early and late years. For the band drums, uh, on, the, on the right, there's only two lines because we only have um, I had particular data for the uh, later years of study. And the key point from this graph is that uh, from the Monteros, you can see that the lines are fairly similar. And there doesn't seem to be much change in the uh, chick provisioning rate, the chick growth rate, over the last 20 years. So it's unlikely that this is a contributing factor to the declining breeding success rate. This takes me on to weather. So uh, weather is another, uh, uh, another possible cause. And these, these four graphs show the, um, the average uh, weather variation. So A and B is temperature. So the top two graphs are temperature uh, in the two breeding years, uh, two, two species with the breeding years along the x-axis. And the C and D is rainfall. Uh, and these graphs show, essentially show that the temperature has generally increased over the last 20 years, and rainfall has generally decreased, being hotter in the summer and wetter in the winter. Not too surprising. When this uh, has, uh, I combined the uh, overall breeding success data from the first graph I showed you with these averages over the 20 years, then again, these really interesting interaction plots. And so today we'll just show you these two interaction plots. We've got the two different species. And then uh, along the uh, x-axis is the breeding season temperature. Uh, and uh, the interaction is the, the breeding season um, uh, rainfall. It's <laughs> missing from the graph. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a maximum in blue and the minimum uh, um, in red of, of the rainfall uh, over uh, each breeding season. And then you've got breeding success along the y-axis. What's really interesting is to then um, step back from this graph and look at the climate change predictions for the Azores, which at the moment say that in the summer uh, it's going to get hotter and drier, and in the winter it's going to get uh, hotter and wetter. And these interaction plots, they need to be taken with a pinch of salt, as we were talking about earlier, because there's uh, limited uh, data. It's, uh, these graphs show that in the years where the current predictions for climate change uh, are occurring, the breeding success is lower. So it's likely that climate change is a contributing factor to the breeding success declines. The final variable I'll briefly mention today is the impact of other species. So 
there were various different causes of egg and chick loss, including uh, uh, causes of weather. Um, but here I just focus on the impact of other species. And these two graphs show the intense periods of study along the x-axis with the two different species. And then the top graph is the percentage um, of eggs lost due to other species, and the bottom one is the percentage of chicks lost due to other species. And I hope you can see from this graph there's quite a stark contrast between the early years, 2000, 2001, and the later years, where only in the early years were one egg lost and two chicks lost due to other species, and that was in the summer season. In comparison to now, where we've got a lot of different interacting, interacting threats causing egg and chick loss. Um, I'd be delighted to chat more about that if, if anyone's um, interested in hearing the different uh, impacts. But this is particularly concerning uh, for the Montero storm petrel, which already has a small population uh, and is endemic to these ores. So the final bit of this chapter of my PhD, I then took uh, the data that I, I could find that had already been published and also the data that I accumulated through my PhD uh, to run a preliminary population viability analysis models. Uh, I used Vortex, quite a common one used by the IUCN. Um, the previous talk was really interesting. It would be great to um, chat more about that. Um, but this graph was uh, on this slide shows the uh, baseline population model results. And the kind of key points from it is that the bandrump storm petrels seem to be fine, whether the, uh, it's from the early years breeding success rate or the, the later years breeding success rate. They reach carrying capacity quite quickly. Interestingly, also the early years for the Montero storm petrel, the darker red line, does reach carrying capacity but takes a while. What's concerning is the 2020 breeding success rate uh, drops uh, and the projection is that it would decline to uh, extirpation on the islet or potentially extinction across the Azores within 100 years. So, uh, again, it would be really interesting to hear uh, other people's thoughts, but one, uh, where I led my discussions through my PhD was that by uh, increasing the breeding success rate uh, of, the, of the Montero storm petrel, by 11 or 26%, it reached a stable or increasing population projection from these preliminary uh, models. And as a potential conservation management suggestion bouncing off that, the uh, targeted nest improvements for, um, uh, would be a really useful uh, starting point, I think, to counter both the climate change impacts, uh, but also the other species causing egg and chick losses. And taking the 11 to 26 percent uh, uh, increases required, this could equate to around a seven to six chick individ um, individual chick addition to the, breeding, um, to the overall chicks that fledge. So just uh, being able to allow 7 to 16 more chicks to fledge a year um, could equate to just uh, uh, star targeted improvements of 30 to 40 nest boxes. So I'm looking forward to having discussions with the organizations on the ground in the Azores as to what's possible um, and look forward to hearing any, anyone's uh, thoughts as well. But for now, in summary, there has been a substantial decline in the overall breeding success rate for the Montero storm petrel. Chick growth doesn't obviously seem to explain the decline in breeding success, but whether, especially in light of the climate change impacts uh, in the Azores and other species causing egg and chick losses seem to be contributing to this uh, breeding success decline. But as I say, there are feasible management actions, and i uh, discuss them more in my PhD, um, but the time to act is now. Thanks, Anna. Any question? Actually, yeah, I have one for you. Uh, I, want, I wonder about uh, the reason why the predation seems to have increased in the last year, and have you thought about that? Yeah, so that's a really interesting one, uh, and there, there are various different factors with that. Um, the uh, habitat itself across the islet is really interesting that um, back in 1996 there was hardly any shrubs on the islet. It was pretty grazed out from rabbits and goats and lots of other things. So the habitat has changed substantially over the last 20 years. Um, yeah, so that's possibly one factor that's at least helping the lizards and ants to increase their population. Um, there are more seabirds around in the summer, so uh, some of the, the, the threats to, to them 
uh, the storm petrel eggs are due to other species, other seabirds coming in. And so there's definitely some interactions going on there. So. And for the lizard, uh, any eradication plan those days, or like rats, if it's a big deal, is there something that we can do? So uh, again, eradication is, is uh, well done and well studied in the mammal, mammal populations uh, for the islands. There are very few, or I found few lizard populations where they've been eradicated. Um, where they had, it was a very quick. They were removed very quickly from the situation. They become established quite quickly. My concern with lizard eradication would be that the, uh, they, to an extent, will eat the ants, uh, and the ants are also a problem. And so, yeah, there's a lot of mismatches that we want to avoid. Um, but it's definitely something I've suggested and would consider, I think, if, if done appropriately. Is someone having an idea of a question? As always, thanks, Anna. And now we are welcoming Marianne Guzzi Leblanc, which will speak about divorce and the cost of it uh, in Brunic Guillemot. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Marianne, and I'm going to talk about divorce. I'm a PhD student in Kyle Elliott Lab at McGill University in Montreal. So before diving with my project, I want to acknowledge all my co authors but also all the people that were collecting the data and all the funding agencies that make Arctic field work possible. Over 80% of avian species form socially monogamous bond, so the choice of a partner is crucial, especially for biparental care species, as both parents are responsible to rear the offspring, as any species of seabird. So staying faithful to the same individual for more than one year allowed bird to save energetic resources that would be allocated to secure a new mate. Pair bond duration has a strong potential to increase the reproductive performance of each bird throughout increasing pair familiarity, coordination, and cooperation. Within a pair bond, the choice of a partner has a strong influence of the reproductive performance as the reproductive decision of each mate, the quality of each mate, as well as how the mate coordinate their effort will impact reproductive success. So we know that the choice of a mate will impact reproductive success. So if a bird is mate with a suboptimal mate, or if the pairing results in poor breeding success, a bird has two options. It could be involved in extra pair copulation, which is quite common in bird, or it can decide to change partner, so to divorce. A divorce happens when a pair separated, when both partners are still alive, and for the subsequent breeding attempt, at least one bird is with a new mate. Divorce is quite common in bird. About 92% of uh, bird can divorce, and the divorce rate is highly variable depending on the species. Individuals are expected to divorce when the fitness benefit outweigh the cost, which is likely to be related to life history trait and species specific. Often, divorce is associated with poor breeding success and a potential increase in breeding success with a new mate. There, here is my study species, the thick bilmer, or brunic gill moth in this part of the world. It's a long-lived species with long and considerable biparental care. And as tick bilmer are breeding in the Arctic, that they are facing a shorter breeding season and a stochastic environment that should uh, add another cause of divorce. And so for all of these reasons, tick bilmer should favor mate the retention and divorce should be costly. Our question here was to assess which factor influenced the probability of divorce. First, we predict that laying date should posit positively impact the probability of divorce. So birds that lay their eggs later during the season 
so they have a higher probability of divorce compared to birds that laid their eggs earlier. On the opposite side, breeding experience, pair bond duration, nesting site quality, survival rate, and fledging success should negatively impact the probability of divorce. So older bird, more experienced bird, should divorce less compared to younger bird. Bird that have been breeding together for a longer period should divorce less often. Same for bird on high quality nesting site. For survival rate, when survival rate is high, there's a less number of great quality, so a lower number of experienced bird available in the population, so birds should divorce less. And finally, when they have a successful fledging, they should have a lower probability of divorce. Our study site is located at Coates Island, Nunavut in Canada. You can see the location of the island here in the Hudson Bay, so it's really a island in the middle of the Hudson Bay. This Stigbilmer colony hosts about 15,000 breeding pair, and demography and feeding ecology has been studied at this site annually since 1984. The data that we are using to answer a question are from 90, 1991 sorry, to 2019. Every summer, population was uh, monitored mid-June to mid-August, and for all the breeding pairs on the plot, a pair outcome was assessed. So a pair was considered faithful when it was the same partner, partner breeding together in successful year, and a pair was assessed as divorce when both partners were reside at the colony, but at least one of them was nesting with a new partner. Here is how, how we assess our variable. So breeding experience is the number of breeding attempt of a bird. Pair bond duration is the number of years that two birds are been breeding together. Nesting site quality was the total number of fledging produced on one nest divided by the number of years that the nest was occupied. Population survival rate at Coats Island was extract from a published study. And we have also had the fledging success for most of our pair. We found a strong correlation between breeding experience and age. And as we had more reliable data for breeding experience, we used breeding experience instead of age. To answer a question, we did some Bayesian modeling based on the model you can see here. And from that, we did some model selection and model averaging. Our final data set includes about 372 breeding attempts over the 24-year period. From that, we can extract about 145 unique pairs, and we record 34 divorce. Here is a figure showing the number of pairs that we had on our plot per year. Dark green is the number of divorce pairs. Light green is the number of faithful pairs. Yearly divorce rate varied from 0% to 43%. And we can extract from that a yearly average divorce rate of 9%. If we zoom in at the factor influencing divorce, here is the figure we can get. So here you have the odd ratio of divorce versus non-divorce. And we can clearly see here that there's only four variables that had an effect. So nesting site quality, female breeding experience, fledging success, and male breeding experience. If we look more closely uh, at these variables, so here is a breeding experience. On the Y, you have the probability of divorce in dark blue and the 95% credible interval in light blue. On the X, you have male or female breeding experience. We can clearly see here on this graph that more a bird is experienced, so older, less is the probability of divorce. For nesting site quality, here is the same figure, but on the X, you have the nesting site quality. So once again, more a bird is nesting on a high quality nesting site, less is the probability of divorce. Finally, if we look at fledging success, 
So on the Y, you have the probability of divorce and the credible interval. And on the X, you have no for unsuccessful fledging and yes for successful fledging. You can see here that bird that had a successful fledging had a lower probability of divorce than bird with unsuccessful fledging. So our yearly average divorce rate of 9% at Cold Island is a little bit higher compared to what was previously found for another thick beamer colony in Norway. We could explain this intraspecific difference by colony size and density or with other factors that we did not include, such as a sex ratio. But when we compare our diverse rate with the sister species, the common myrrh, we can see that our 9% is quite similar to the common myrrh. Our results show that in thick bill myrrh, divorce occurs in pair with unsuccessful fledging, inexperienced individual, low quality nesting site. So we can say that divorce is probably linked to low breeding success rather than opportunism, as we didn't find any effect or survival rate, but we had an effect on a fledging success on the probability of a divorce. The fact that inexperienced individual, younger bird divorce more often, could be linked with the fact that for thick bilmer, we know that inexperienced bird, younger bird, are not as success successful as older, more experienced bird. For younger bird, there's also a higher possibility of improvement with a new partner. So for younger bird, there's probably more benefit from a divorce than for older bird. Lastly, the fact that bird on low quality nesting site divorce more often is similar to what was found for common myrrh. So it's important to better understand divorce as we know that it influences many mechanisms such as fitness, bearing decision, but also bigger pictures such as genetic structure or population dynamic. So my take home message for you today is that tick bill marriage divorce occasionally when they are young, inexperienced, on low quality nesting site, or when they have a low reproductive success. So I would be happy to take any question and thank you for your attention. Ryan, any question? Hi, thanks. Uh, great talk. Um, the, what I was wondering, is there any difference between edge of range and center of range? Just because you said Kongsfjord was quite successful, and that's pretty much right at the northern edge of their range. Do you, do you have any data or any comment on that? Um, I, we know that there is no effect of age on the quality side, so that there's no correlation between age and uh, nesting site. But about the range, um, it's something I would like to look in if different colony or different latitude, there's uh, an effect on uh, divorce rate. I don't know if I answer clearly to your question, but it's something I would like to, to look yeah, and compare other thick bimmer colony. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, I think I'm right in saying that um, perhaps it was Sarah Wallace and Mike Harris found a higher divorce rate in common guillemots that were tagged um, a while ago. And I wondered if any of your population that you were observing were tagged and whether that's something you'd considered. Uh, all the birds here are tagged. It's one of the oldest monitoring plot that we have. Uh, we start, they start banding bird in 1984, so all the bird that I include in this analyze are tag. And um, did they have loggers attached at any point or just did uh, ones? Probably more recently, but in the past we didn't have any logger. But I don't think there's an effect of GPS or GLS on uh, breeding success. But it's something we can, we can look, yeah. Hello, interesting talk. 
Do you mentioned extra pair breeding. Do you know the percentage for the population and what are the choices between divorce or extra pair breeding for the species? One study was published in 21, 22, and for thick beamer, the extra pair paternity are around 7%, but I cannot comment about the fact if they usually decide to go with uh, an extra pair paternity or a divorce. All good? Thanks, Mayan. So the next two talks are short ones, and the first one is made by Kate Litton Matthews about the contra contrasting sorry prebreeding condition and how they may affect uh, condition dependent reproduction and population dynamics in Atlantic. I shortened the title since it's just a five minute talk. So it's consequences <laughs> of survival and reproduction correlations for Atlantic puffins. And my name's Kate and I'm working at Nina in Norway. So the background to this is that demographic rates like survival and reproduction don't usually fluctuate independently over time. So in some, to some extent, they're correlated um, over time. And negative correlations can occur as a result of life history trade-offs, but positive correlations can be because multiple demographic rates respond to the environment in the same way. Uh, and just so, if we think for seabirds, we can imagine two correlations actually between survival and reproduction because survival is usually measured from one breeding season to the next. So you could have a correlation between survival prior to breeding and reproductive success, or between reproductive success and survival after breeding. And the mechanisms behind these correlations can be quite complex. For example, it could be to do with individual uh, carryover effects, or just because of the fact that the environment itself is correlated. And I'm seeing maybe you're wondering, why do we care about this? Because um, <laughs> these correlations, if, for example, positive correlations, lead to increased variation um, into year-to-year -year population growth rate, which in turn means uh, greater risk of extinction, and vice versa for negative correlations. This reduces the overall variability in population growth. So this is something we, we are obviously should be worried about in conservation studies. Um, a recent study I made that a bit bigger. Um, I think someone mentioned it by Fayetal um, in Ecology Letters this year. They looked at these demographic correlations between survival and reproduction for a whole bunch of species with different generation times. And what they found was first that these correlations tend to be positive, and also they suggested that they are predominantly driven by environmental conditions rather than the species' life history characteristics per se. So what we wanted to do here was kind of test this more formally. So we looked and studied these correlations um, in multiple populations of the same species, and that species was the Atlantic puffin. So we asked if the strength of survival, I mean adult survival reproductive correlations, differs between populations of the same species, therefore we assume because of differing environmental conditions. And we do some fancy population modeling to um, estimate the contributions of these correlations to the variation in population growth. Um, as I said, it's, we use long-term demographic data from three puffin populations, um, which breed at Isle of May, Rist, and Hornaya. These three colonies don't overlap during any period of the year and have very different migratory strategies, so therefore they experience very different environments. So we uh, yeah, estimated the correlation between adult survival and reproduction at these two time lags I mentioned, and decomposed the variation in population growth into contributions from variance in adult survival, variance in breeding success, and variance in the correlation between them. Straight into the results. Um, so here on the graph, you see the correlation between adult survival and reproduction for these three populations, Isle of May, Rust, and Hornea. And what we found in line with Fay and colleagues is that these correlations are generally positive, but there were substantial um, differences between populations in the strength of these um, correlations. So for Rust, the, none of these correlations were actually significant, while for Isle of May we saw these, these really strong correlations between uh, adult survival and breeding success. And with this information, what we could do is, um, using a population model and what's called a life table response experiment, we could actually quantify how much first adult survival um, contributes to the variation in population growth rates, 
uh, <laughs> show, which is shown in blue, and then how much variation in breeding success contributes to population growth, and also the correlation between them. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting things here which I don't really have time to go into, but if we just look at Urnai on the bottom, we saw that it's actually adult survival that's the main demographic driver here in this system. It's contributing most to the variation in population growth, um, in contrast to just in the middle, uh, where it's breeding success that's the main, or is, is, a, is a major driver here, more so than Hornea. And also we see it, that in some cases, for example, I of May, it's this correlation between adult survival and breeding success that's contributing a lot to variability in, um, in population growth. And if I come back to what I said in the start, this is, this is really relevant for conservation because if you do have populations with very strong uh, correlations, these populations are more sensitive to environmental change because if you've got higher adult survival, you've got higher breeding success or vice versa. So, um, so this basically brings me to my take-home message, which is that demographic correlations should be included as an integral part of conservation studies, specifically um, population viability analysis, which we've heard quite a bit about. Because if you don't include them, you may actually underestimate, um, for example, a threat like bycatch or overfishing and the threat to that in population projections. So I think these should become more used. And, yep, thanks for listening. I know that was a bit of a whirlwind talk. <laughs> and a very, very, sorry, a very quick thank you to colleagues involved in this, uh, field workers. And I want to say this is also funded as part of the CPOP program. Yep. Thanks. Really straight to the point. You should drink now. <laughs> <laughs> Any question for Kate to, to develop a tiny bit more? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody? Um, do you, Good luck. Any cues to explain why Hornoya is so different for the two others? I mean, what would have been nice to have a bit more time to, to, to show actually the changes we've seen at the different colonies. Of course, for example, just maybe many people know, has seen very big repeated years of breeding fa failure, so a lot of variation in breeding success. Whereas at Hornai, particularly the last few years, the variation in adult survival has become quite large, which is quite surprising, especially in long-lived species. You know, they should have pretty stable survival. So that's what's shining through in the results we get. But I couldn't quite fit that slide in, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And the last talk of the day is Samuel Langlois, which will talk about predation of girls on Atlantic puffin. Seven more minutes and we can all go home. <laughs> right, um, yeah, so I'm Sam, I'm a PhD researcher at the Environmental Research Institute in Thurso, and I'm gonna try to get across some of my PhD one of my PhD chapters in five minutes, uh, which is about quantifying the impacts of predation by great rabbit gulls uh, on an Atlantic puffin population and what the implications of this relationship is uh, for the management of both species. So my study site is the Isle of May, so by now everyone knows where it is. It's in southeast Scotland, and my two study species are pictured on the right. The Isle of May, it's home to an internationally important population of Atlantic puffins, and the last census was carried out in 2017, and they estimated it was at 39,200 pairs. On the other hand, uh, great white gulls colonized the island in the 1980s, and they've been incre um, increasing steadily since then, um, and it's a, um, approximately around 120 pairs um, as of 2021. So, Ever since the gulls colonized the island, there was a bit of concern around the potential impacts these species could have on the Atlantic puffin. And this is particularly because it's one of the few species that is able to feed on adult birds. And when it comes to long-lived species with low fecundity, adult survival is kind of like the key parameter when it comes to population growth. So two previous studies have quantified puffin mortality on the Isle of May in 2001 and 2017. And between these two years, uh, puffin predation increased by 300%, and the gull population increased by 322%, so roughly a proportional increase in size. So this is potential that is maybe we have a wildlife conflict in our hands. But this is made more 
complicated, as an extra element of complexity, and that is that the predator should now also be considered a species of conservation concern. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we published uh, this paper as one of uh, my other PhD chapters where we estimated that the species has declined globally by 48%. So we hope that from now on, this current, and actually we're trying to get the status on the IUCN changed from least concerned to vulnerable. So we hope that from now on, this will be taken into account when it comes into the management of this species. Now that you know a bit about the background of this project, uh, we have a couple of um, objectives with this study. And the first one is we're interested in knowing what the impact of the current predation rate on the Isle of May is on the Atlantic puffin population growth rate. And after that, we're interested in estimating what might happen in future years if the gull population continues to increase and potentially the predation rate also continues to increase. And we want to establish predation thresholds so we can provide useful information for conservation managers. And then we also want to get these results and highlight the relevance um, of the of highlight the, re the relevance of this study for the conservation for the management of both species and also its relevance uh, when it comes to environmental impact assessments and compensatory measures associated with renewable energy developments. There's a whole lot of methods and results I've excluded because I only have five minutes. So if you want to discuss any of it, come find me later on or tomorrow. But in a nutshell, we use population viability analysis. And we use state-based uh, matrices, and we, build, we use two approaches, deterministic and stochastic approaches over a period of 66 years, which is the three-generation period of, of Atlantic puffins. And that is um, it's a, it's a criteria that goes in line with the IUCN criteria. Uh, we use deterministic PVAs to get a, um, an understanding of the dynamics of the, of the underlying dynamics of the puffin population and calculate uh, population growth rate under, the, uh, under different predation scenarios. And we also run uh, stochastic PVAs to calculate what were the probability of population declines and extinction. Uh, so quickly, uh, kind of like a really quick snapshot of the results. Um, here we've got uh, the total, Atlantic, total number of Atlantic puffins predated uh, per year along the x-axis, and then we've got puffin population growth rate on the y-axis. And I've got uh, three different population sizes. Uh, the middle one is the initial populations. It, it was the count from the um, population size from the last count, which is 39,000 pairs. And the other two are the 95% uh, confidence, confidence intervals from that count. And I've also marked with a red line uh, the current level of predation on the Isle of May. And as you can see, the current level of predation still allows the population to remain above one, which represents a stable population although it is slightly lower than a population with no predation, which is the first data point. Uh, however, <clears throat> the current level of predation is still far from causing the population growth rate to dip below one. Um, we more or less estimated that the number needed, the number of puffins predated per year needed to induce a population decline was around 5,500, so still quite far from that figure. And uh, the stochastic models also suggested there was estimated there was a probability of pretty much 0% of causing a population decline under the current predation pressure. So just quickly to wrap things up. First of all, uh, we estimated that the current predation pressure that the puffins are suffering on the Isle of May is not enough to induce a population decline. And we estimated that the threshold needed to cause a population decline sits at about 5,500 puffins per year. However, this level of predation that does impact the demographics of the population, and we think that is something that should be considered an environmental impact assessment or as part of, as part of a bigger set of cumulative impacts. So, <clears throat> and then just to finish off with one last recommendation, uh, the Isle of May is probably quite unique. It's, quite, it's really small, and pretty much all of it is accessible. So the best thing that can be done in the future to monitor this situation is to do regular surveys and collect puffing carcasses. And that is it's really simple, but it's probably the most informative and effective way of getting an idea of annual mortality of puffins. Thank you for listening. Any question? I'm just curious about, do you have any idea when, when the puffins were being predated and whereabouts were they being predated, like in the colony or while they were at sea? 
Uh, they appeared in the colony. Uh, the great papaga population appears to have a few specialists in it. And the hunting strategies is quite varied, so they're able to catch birds on land and flying, but it's usually within the colony. And they always, they most of the time, take the puffins to the specific areas that you just have standing water there so they can soften the meat. Um, <laughs> quite, it's quite graphic going to the colony. But <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Samuel. Question? Oh, yes, there is another. Hey, Sam, great talk. Um, I just wanted to know, in your wider project, will you be taking into account the predation of puffin chicks or eggs by great blackbacks as well? So this includes, it's, it's part of the methods. So a uh, previous study by Sophie Bennett, who I think is in the audience today, uh, they calculated uh, the predation per age class. So puffins were collected and aged. So into the models, we, we specified the proportion of each age class that gets predated. Cool, thanks for clarifying. Have you thought about the indirect effects of predation on the puffin population as well, the changes in behavior? Um, no, um, so now can you be a bit more specific? <laughs> uh, I guess like to reduce activity, to avoid in, uh, the goals, um, maybe like affect the fledglings, I guess. Uh, so the... The gulls are distributed. There's kind of there's a high density of great blubber gulls on the island, and then there's um, they're all in the north where the puffin density isn't as high. And then there's the odd pair that, and it seems to be this odd pairs that are fairly far apart from each other that tend to become the puffin and rabbit specialist. Um, but no, I haven't seen anything really different from the puffins other than um, you know, when they bring food to the colony, they always go as fast as they can to the barrow. That's it. But there's, you know, there's plenty of birds loafing and stuff. So it's, it's kind of like, it seems to catch them by surprise every time. All good? Thanks. Thank you.